Hello, everybody. Welcome on the Light Zone Data Show. Today, we're going to talk about how to become a data driven organization. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, if you're watching this live, please feel free to send in your comments, your questions, your feedback, and type in hashtag Light Zone Data for a chance to win a copy of Be Data Driven, which is today's topic as well, <laughs> from our, our dear guest, Jordan Morrow. Great Jordan, welcome. Have. The oh, thank you so much. Pleasure. Happy to be back. I have the pleasure of introducing Jordan. So Jordan is known as the godfather of data literacy, having helped pioneer in the field by building one of the world's first data literacy programs and driving thought leadership. Jordan is VP and Head of Data and Analytics at Brainstorm and a global trailblazer in the world of data literacy, having built one of the world's first data literacy programs. He served as the chair of the advisory board of the um, uh, Data Literacy Project, has spoken at numerous conferences around the world, and is an active voice in the data and analytics community. He has also helped companies and organizations around the world, including the United Nations, to build and understand data literacy. When not found within his work of data, Jordan is happily married with five kids, everyone. <laughs> Jordan is also an avid trail runner and loves fitness, entering the racing in multiple ultra marathons and having fun adventures in the mountains. Jordan is also an avid reader, often reading or using Audible to go through multiple books at the same time. Oh my God. Welcome, Jordan. <laughs> Thanks for having me. So I should say five kids, two dogs and a bunny. I know. Oh, well. <laughs> don't How old don't ask me why. Um, yeah, just not very smart. That's what it is. The kids are that <laughs> smart. Having three pets, that's not smart. <laughs> How old are your kids? Uh, 14 down to five. So we're, we're at that stage. Like there's this transition where the oldest is old enough to watch your younger kids mm. life changing, right? Then you get, then it's date night every week. Now all five kids are in school for some part of the day. So it's like, more freedom, but it's also sad to lose the the smallness, if you will, of mm -hmm. them. So. Right. Wow, that's amazing. That's a huge achievement. Congratulations. Thanks. Tell us a little bit more about your hobbies. So George tells me that you are a very high performer in those fields. Yeah. So can you tell us? Oh more? man. So I, I'm I'm a very early riser. So I get asked a question like, "How do you do all that I do?" It's because I could get up at four a.m. and I'm totally okay with that, right? Mm -hmm. And so. Like uh, hobby wise, I love the fitness world. So we'll go outside data and analytics because that's, we're, we'll talk plenty of that, but I love the fitness world. So I weight lift, I love to spin, I run, I love mountains. I live in the mountains in Utah. Um, absolutely love mountain adventures, but hobby wise, a lot of it is of course, as you can imagine, um, family oriented. So like last week, I took all my kids to Salt Lake's version of Comic-Con and gave my wife a night to herself. We stayed in a hotel. She got to shop and do all these things. And it was just a blast. And that's where if people saw my post, I, I met Brent Spiner, who was Data on Star Trek and got him to sign my, my, my hardcover copy okay. of that book. One of the best stories, though, is the guy who was sitting next to him and I think helping do all this stuff for the autographs and the pictures and all that. He's like, man, I need help with this. And I just so happened to have a copy of my book. So I gave him a copy of my book. So that was pretty funny. Um, but <laughs> that I was <did>. perfect. <laughs> oh, yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll get more work with Brent Spiner there. Um, but I do love to read. And, and whether I'm reading the book or listening on, on Audible, I love books. I, I think books have power. I think that um, learning has power, which maybe is why I'm, I'm drawn so much to data literacy. So, yeah, lots of outside hobbies. But then again, it's. Uh, data and analytics is is passion is not an adequate enough word for me on that one. I love the power that it has and uh, do a lot in that space. Writing book three right now. So we'll have to have a third episode, George, when that comes out. Sounds great. We'll be happy to have you for the third time. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about this. So you, you've combined yeah. your passion for reading, for sharing your knowledge, and you do have a lot of knowledge to share. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're teaching us how to become a data driven organization. Let's let's first uncover what does what does it mean really to be data driven? Yeah, and, and to answer that, if it's okay, I'll give a little background on the book. So if you if you remember early in the pandemic, right, we, we've shut everything down. 
businesses are now all remote and things like that. And I was getting a lot of meetings. I actually thought my schedule would open up when the shutdown occurred. It did not. It got busier. Um, I used to travel a lot prior to the pandemic. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking, man, my calendar is going to be open. I would joke that my family is going to get sick of me because I'm not on the road as much. I worked remotely prior to it. And the opposite occurred. And I started to get like I, I maybe the word is flooded. That might not be the right word um, with meetings. And I think the reason that happened was companies, if, if you think about what was happening during the pandemic, the ability to use data in, mm -hmm. in such a vital moment would have been paramount, right? To have all this different stuff, all this information, correct or incorrect, whatever coming. And I think companies discovered they weren't ready to do that. And so they called the data literacy nerd. They called me up and we talk and all that. And in those first few months, that term being data driven started to gain, I would say, more steam. And so it was yeah. like, right, we're going to write on this topic, built a proposal. It was unanimously approved um, by the publisher. And so wrote the book. And then and then as you fast forward um, in 2021, we got in those doldrums, if you will, with the pandemic, everything just dragging on. And then this year it's come back with force, which thankfully for me as the author, I, I love because it happened when the book was launched or, or prior. But if you think about it from this holistic sense, companies have invested so much money in data and analytics um, and tools and technologies and all this stuff. And they don't see a good return on investment, period. It, it just no company I've come across is fully doing this holistically. Yeah. And yeah. so being data driven, let's just simplify this straight up for everyone, just means that you're utilizing data and analytics to help in your decision making process. It's that simple but we overcomplicate it. And, and don't get me wrong, there is a ton of complexity with privacy laws, governance, backend, frontend, data literacy, all these things, I get that. But I think we, we get so distracted and we get so bogged down maybe by all that is out there that we lose sight that the end goal of data and analytics is just to help the business make smarter decisions to reach mm -hmm. its business goals. Mm -hmm. That's being data driven. Mm -hmm. And so when you build companies and help them work through this and build these things, that needs to be that key focus. We're doing this to help meet our business objectives. And I think that, that there's power in the simplicity of it. And when you understand that simplicity, that's when you then get back from and say, OK, that's the simplicity. Now, where do we currently stand in being data driven? And we have to be fully honest with ourselves. We can't just beat around the bush and say, oh, I think we're doing well. No, if, if we're not doing well, we have to have that honest conversation with ourselves, find the gaps, learn from it and then build it out. So you have a whole section on the gaps uh, mm -hmm. in, in your book that you're talking about. What are some of the gaps that really stood out to you? I think I think the number one gap, and, it, and maybe because this is my field, uh, my baby, is data literacy. Mm -hmm. And it's because if you think about, let's let's I use an example, hypothetical, 10,000 person organization. How many people in a 10,000 person organization are truly data and analytics professionals? At most, and I'm being generous here, you could say 500, mm -hmm. right? So 9,500 of them are not. And that 500 is a big number, yeah. right? So if you don't have end users, individual contributors, data users who are confident and comfortable in using data, that gap is going to be a big issue because you're democratizing it out. People are getting self-service analytics. These are the things that are happening. Mm -hmm. But when they're not comfortable and confident with it, why would they ever use it or do anything different, right? Data and analytics is intimidating. People have fears of it and all of that. So we have to upskill in that data literacy. In fact, there was a report. I, those that know me know I, I started my data literacy journey to a degree. And my first idea was when I was at American Express, but at Click is where really hit the momentum and got it going. Um, while at Click, Click launched a study. This might be 2017 or 2018 that said one in five people is confident in their data literacy skills. They launched a study this year or they launched the results of the study this year. And it was about one out of 10 people were now confident. So it was 11%. Now I think we have to understand and be data literate on this. Does that mean our data literacy skills went down? No. My guess is there's more recognition of what it truly means to be confident in your data literacy skills. Um, whereas a few years ago, people are sitting there saying, I'm, I'm confident in this now, maybe now that there's more data, more tools, the pandemic shed lights on things, all these things mm -hmm. We're now one out of 10 people. Right. Now imagine you've spent all this money, you're buying all these tools, you're cleaning all this data 
And as an executive, a chief data officer, whatever you are, you're not seeing a return on it. And that's not because you didn't invest in the right tool. That's what gets blamed frequently. The data gets blamed frequently. And I don't think blame needs to be the right word. What we need to do is upskill people to have that confidence to do it. That's the number one gap. Um, other gaps that can exist is leadership buy-in. Do we truly have leadership's buy-in, right? Or are they just giving it, you know, happy phrases that say, we want to invest in this and do that. And then they truly don't. Well, then as an employee, if you think about it, if I'm sitting here thinking to myself, yes, I, I want to be data literate, but I'm not really seeing it happen from leadership. Why would I ever do it? Um, other things is I did like one of the gaps that and I'm not sure I even wrote about this one in the book, but has become more prevalent that I'm seeing now is the disconnect between an understanding, a fundamental understanding of where data lies and where it ties to the business. I mean, mm -hmm. we talk about that all the time. But in my work, I've got one company, I won't because I don't want to talk down on them, but this is one of the most prominent companies you can see in the entire world. Um, I had an email from them this morning. I'm doing work with them. And the lack of understanding of how to tie data to the business or the importance of tying data teams to business teams, it's kind of unfathomable at this organization because the what the data could do. So there's all these gaps that are out there. Yeah, Not, yeah. And of course, number one roadblock for data and analytics success is absolutely the culture, right? And, and that goes to data literacy and all these different things. So anyway. Yeah, I was going to mention that as well as you uh, definitely uh, write about absolutely. it. Absolutely. Culture. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I find that that's, that can be hard to change. And of mm -hmm. course, it's kind of dependent on everything else that you've mentioned yeah. so far. Uh, but it can take a while to change uh, either because you need to retrain those people and, and instill a new culture in them, or you need to have new people instead. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I, what I would say to it too, is like, there's, there's two things that I make jokes about. One of them is how many of you think it's easy to change a company culture? It's not right. Change management programs fail probably all the time. You can't just march into a business and say, we're going to change your culture. Right. And so what I say is, when, when we look at culture, since it is the number one um, roadblock for data and analytics success is we've got to help people feel at ease and just say, instead of changing what you do, let's just add some tools to your tool belt. Let's give you some more skills. Like how many people don't have busy jobs in our day and age, right? Mm -hmm. That is a, no one, right? What if we give you a tool and access to something that can improve it along with the skills to do it? I can't just give tools and do all that, but if I give those things over, then we could do it. The other one is I joke and say, how many of us love to get emails that say you have mandatory training? No one, right? And so if we try and run a data literacy initiative that way, it's still going to get squashed. So the culture is a tough one. And so I think it's one of those where we have to teach people. We're not trying to change. Culture is what makes organizations successful. Can we just weave the DNA of data throughout the culture where people are confident and comfortable in using these things that it allows us to um, to truly maybe I lost my train of thought, but to truly see fruition uh, to these things and and to help people just feel this calmness that we're right now we are on Streamyard, publishing through LinkedIn. Those are tools yep. we can treat create in people's minds that data and analytics are just tools to simplify our world. And I think that's a powerful message to share around it. And that's, you know, that's another topic that you cover in your book, the, the tools and the technology uh, to help us become more yeah. data driven. Absolutely. Tools are, this is the thing, I, and I'll use an example. I was meeting with a financial institution um, from Australia. This is a few years ago, probably gal, maybe just under three years ago, 2019. Mm -hmm. And the, I was at Click and Click was coming to me, the sales teams, because this organization was like, not getting adoption of the click software like they wanted, right? I think at the time Gartner or someone said adoption of data and analytics tools is like 20 or 30%. So it's kind of standard that these things are not adopted as well as they should be. And so this financial institution was asking us and saying, okay, we're going to do a proof of concept. You have to prove us against Tableau. So they come to me and they say, help us. And I'm like, well, here's the thing, right? The conversation turned to, I don't care what tool they're using. If they don't have proper data literacy sitting in that organization, the tool will not be adopted. So they can implement Tableau over Click, Power BI over Click, ThoughtSpot. Look, I don't care what the tool is. If you don't give people skills on using data, 
We could give them skills on using the tool, point and click here, do this and that. That's fine. But if we don't give them schools skills on how to use data, they'll be back looking for a new tool a year later. Tools and technology are powerful, but that's they're not a strategy. End point. Data visualization is not the end point of data and analytics, but those are things that have been ingrained or become part of mindsets with people. Tools and technology should be there to do exactly that. They are tools. So if you have a goal, if I'm building a house and I say, George, come help me, I want you to get this nail into that wood and I give you a screwdriver, it's not going to work. Or if I give you a hammer and you don't know how to use it, it's not going to work. So we have to balance this data skills with tool skills, but let, again, the overarching thing should be, what is our objective as, as a business? How is data supporting it? What tools will support that? And then underlying skills that do that. Progression, not just, hey, that tool looks awesome. It's a bright, shiny object. Here's the thing too, no offense to salespeople who work for data and analytics vendors, they make those tools purr like a cat and they make them look amazing. But guess what kind of data they're using? They're probably using very manicured, perfect data that makes it look that way. The moment you put it on your own data and it doesn't look that way, frustration, right? Oh, it doesn't look the way it does there. Well, obviously it doesn't look that way. So we, we need to balance all these things out. So anyway, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So uh, thinking about the people who are listening to us. So I find that we have a segment of people who are looking into uh, getting into to becoming data professionals. And then the second um, large segment are people who are already data professionals and they are looking for, you know, better education and, yeah. um, you know, um, increasing or expanding their horizon. So. My question would be if, uh, let's say, um, we have a, a data professional and they, they want to to convince their organization to become more data literate, so what, what would those steps be, the ones that you recommend? And then for the second group who wants to become more data literate or um, to, to get into the, uh, this, the, the data profession, but be besides uh, reading your book, what would be the <laughs> steps to take? So it's a two-part question. Absolutely. Basically. So keep me honest to make sure I don't forget the second part. Yes. So let me start with the first. How do you get buy-in? In fact, I see Susan Walsh. Hi, Susan. Yes. Hi, um, Susan. That's the question. How can we get leadership buy-in? How do we get people to buy into this? One of the first things, it, it is very difficult for someone inside to try and be a voice on this and fully get by it. And the reason I say that is, especially from leadership, if you're working inside there, leadership, there, there are tiers, there are hierarchies, whether there should be or not, different topic. But having it be an internal voice is hard. I would say, first off, to get people in, suggest bringing in an external speaker, right? Bring in somebody who is an outside expert. I, I speak to companies all the time. I have one or two, I have two sessions tomorrow where I'm, I'm, I'm a keynote in one, no, three counting at scale. Can't forget at scale. So I've got three tomorrow, right? Bring somebody in who has an outside voice, who is an outside expert to share, right? And it, and it can just be exploratory. It could be like a Ted talk. It could be whatever it is, but getting an outside voice to come in, I think it shouldn't, but it does has more weight and sway than someone internally. And that's because they're internal to it, right? They're this internal person who are a part of it, et cetera. Um, so that'd be one way. Now, number two or three for how do you get this started? If you are a data professional, whatever it is, number one, does your organization have a chief data officer? If it doesn't be the leader that you need to be, to be the voice, um, create a proof of concept. And what I mean by that is let's say you're an organization of 5,000 people and you have a team personally of 15, drive a data literacy initiative with your 15 people to create a proof of concept. And from that proof of concept, also have a library of about four or five projects where you used data and it proves successful. Then what you're creating is call it a library of success stories. So when people are like, great, I've heard of this, but show me how it works. Fine. You pull it right off your library and you say, this project, we did a data literacy program. We assessed everybody. We upskilled them. And by the way, we put them on projects. Here are three projects where we use data that it worked. Mm -hmm. Then you have tangible proof of something occurring. Then you have tangible proof of making that happen. The one thing I would say, because we're talking about in the second part of this question, upskilling non-data professionals, there's an upskilling that has to happen with data professionals. And that is the communication side. That is the ability to truly tell stories with data and to get your point across effectively and in a simple manner. 
right? With data and analytics, it can be extremely complex, but being able to simplify the complex down into the simple so that the non-data professional or leaders or whatever can hear it and buy in and understand it is a key talent that individuals that are data professionals can have. Here's an example for me. I'm, I teach at Columbia University about every semester in the Masters of Statistics. They brought me in to teach a subject that might, it, I don't know if it's shot, it's communication. It's not to come in and teach statistics. It's teaching statistics people in a master's program how to communicate, right? So do you have this data professional? So you've got the outside speaker, run a data literacy proof of concept program and create a library, three to five examples of where data was used and it was successful and where you can show how the upskilling of the individuals worked. It's not one size fits yeah. all though. Give them assessment to get started. Now, let's go to the second part, and that is the non-data professional, and how do we upskill them? It's twofold. Number one, it's creating the mindset of a data professional. And if you're a data professional and this isn't your mindset, you need to develop it too. It's my three C's of data literacy. This is a mindset to get people into that data literacy flow. Curiosity, creativity, critical thinking. We need to get really good at questioning things, asking questions. We, but now if we are data professionals, we have to be good at allowing people to question our stuff. I think data professionals hold on to what they've built as sacred. Questions are a good thing. There's nothing that says the question means what you're presenting is not accurate. No, it could be hundred percent accurate, but are there different ways to look at it? We as data professionals have to be open-minded to say, you know what? I understand what I built, but that non-data professional doesn't. So as a non-data professional, as someone getting going in data literacy that can then contribute to being data driven, number one, be curious. Number two, use your creative talent within data. That question comes up, do I have a seat at the data and analytics table? Everybody does. Everybody does. I don't care what your background is or anything. Use that. Use your creativity, your experience, your gut feel. We're not getting rid of that. We're combining gut feel with the data. And then number three, one of the best things you could do in data and analytics is get really, really good at critical thinking, right? Shutting mm -hmm. down, shutting down your phone, shutting down your Slack, whatever it is, your email, looking at data that sits in front of you. It could be a data visualization, any of that, and start to break it down. You don't necessarily have to do the advanced analytics, but start to filter, start to do different things. So that's the mindset side, curiosity, creativity, critical thinking. Then there's the actual data literacy side on a technical side, reading, working with, analyzing, and communicating with data. The starting point that I would probably tell people if you're a non-data professional is get really good at reading and interpreting data. That's it. Because without being able to read it well, can you work with it, analyze it, and communicate? And so that's kind of this blueprint. I understand that that right there is very short and condensed. There's a lot that can go into that, but mindset, three C's of data literacy, and then digging into the technical side from the simplistic, learning to read with it. And then eventually you could get good at data visualizations and how to build them better. By the way, shout out to Kate. I think I saw her on her book. I, I was able to help review that, knowing how to use color in a visualization. Don't start there, but use it, right? Get good at reading, interpreting, and then being like, you know what? They, I read Kate's book. I should have used that color there that sort of thing, right? And mm -hmm. those are ways to further it out. The final thing that I would say for data professionals and non-data professionals alike is all everything that I just talked about goes to waste if you don't know how to make a decision with it. And that's decision-making with data. Being able to make a data-driven decision is important. So that's a long answer, but I could probably talk about this for hours, which I, I know we don't have time for, but that's where I would say start and anybody who's interested, just reach out to me and I can expand on these different pieces more. Oh, thank you, Jordan. Th there's awesome. a lot to uncover here. And I wanted to mention a few things, but I didn't want to interrupt you. You had a, a beautiful flow there going. Uh, one, and on communication, I think that's, I completely agree. That's so important. Uh, as you know, I, I, I work and I, I teach data governance, which I think also relies on communication. And I think a lot of any really data management, data analytics, data science activities really, they need to rely on this important skill for everybody to have. I was at a conference years ago and the IDC, the International Data Consortium was mentioning data governance is 90% communication. And I was really just starting in my career at that point. And I thought, no, that's a bit of over an overkill, but 
more and more, I, I, I agree. I think it's so much really relies on communication and being able to communicate what you're doing um, and why are you doing it and how does it tie to the what's in it for me uh, yeah. piece and back to the business needs. Oh, you're and spot this on. Goes, and th this goes to, yeah, anything on that you do with data. Like it's, it's one of those, we get so caught up in the, and enamored with how cool data and analytics is, but the secret sauce of it all is communication. And yeah. because I could build a cool analysis, I could build the right data governance program. If I can't communicate it out and teach people, oh, well, yeah. right. Yeah. It, it might be off or not. And, and Deanna likes to um, have an even bigger umbrella over it and, and say, you know, it's not just about communication, but it's about the whole change management aspect, because with data, we're introducing some change. It, yes. You know, even so it's beneficial, it does introduce change, it does create an impact, and uh, people are resistant to change by nature, by their Absolutely. nature. So you need to to manage that, yes. And communication is a big uh, tool that you're you're using to manage it with, but also rewards and training and, and uh, Absolutely. whatnot. Absolutely. It's all holistic. I think it can't be isolated, like gamification. All these things matter mm -hmm. in that holistic data-driven approach, 100%. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to add a couple more steps to what you mentioned before and how to become more data literate, um, data driven. And well, the next one is to read your book, be data literate. And the next one after that is read your newest book, be data driven. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and the third book teaser for everybody is be data analytical, where I go wow. into the four levels of analytics and it's not going to be formulas. There'll be things in there on how to improve in all four levels from a data literacy perspective then hopefully it translates into a data-driven perspective and hopefully empowering everybody to just do better with those. Cause it's data is wonderful, but it mm -hmm. needs something to bring it to life. Um, Scott, you know, he had, and all that where he gets mad when people are like data without analytics is, is nothing. Well, it kind of is, but analytics without good data is nothing. They need to be together. And so we have to do all those things and make sure that that coin is flipped and, and done right and works well together. Nice. Karen has a question here. Uh, would you say shifting responsibility for data to the business and away from IT is key for changing that culture and letting the business drive the value? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say what I would say is not necessarily shifting responsibility is the terminology I would use. 100% the business, like business strategy and data strategy need to go together. Executive, mm -hmm. you, you can't just silo things off like in the past. So, oh, data will sit over there. The business sits over there. It needs to all be interconnected, even IT, right? Digital transformation. Why are we using these tools and technologies? Forget about data for a second. Everything is this holistic approach that comes back to how are these things helping the business succeed with its strategy and outcomes? That's, that's it, right? And so when we say shift responsibility, I want to say shift responsibility. I think we need to make the business side more accountable and responsible for data literacy and data strategy. Then on the flip side, IT has a responsibility to be literate within business strategy. So it, there's this other side. Jason Krantz is looking at this now, right, is, is taking data professionals to really understand the business side of things. And I think so it's not a shift in responsibility. I think everybody is accountable. Everybody is responsibility. Diana, you said it well with the change management. There is this fundamental shift that has to occur. Evolution, change management, weaving DNA of data. So where the data side understands business and business understands data. That is how you become data driven, right? It's when you silo it off and isolate it, big problems. But when you look at it from that mindset, yes, flow it all together to create those better outcomes with data. Jordan, do you have a favorite um, example of an organization that became data driven? And I know you have a, a few examples peppered throughout your book. I think one of my favorites that really stood out to me is how you're talking about Airbnb, the fact that they're not in the business of uh, vacation rentals, but they're in the business of customer service. And that's because they're really uh, plugging into that part of data and uh, giving them all these insights about their customers to be able to service them better. Yeah, I, I think there's, I, I think it's interesting when you think of, companies that are data companies, it should be every single one now. So I'll give an example of a company that I, I like this story a lot. Those who have ever watched Shark Tank, um, they I forget his name, the, the gentleman who is the meme investor, right? And right. his son, I forget his nickname, and Mr. Um, Wonderful or whatever it is, his son was working at Tesla. 
and an intern or something like that. And his son said, dad, you should invest in this. And his dad was like, why would I invest in a car company? And I don't know if it was his son or what flipped the dad switch. But then when the dad realized Tesla is a data company, right? Mm -hmm. Like I own one. And it's it, you think about how much data gets processed, like maps, all these different things. That's awesome. Right mm -hmm. now, I understand I'm nerdy and I get that. That's fine. But I mean, if you really dig into that, that's awesome to think about that. It wasn't looked at as a car company. It was looked at as a company that is a data company, which so happens to sell cars. And so for me, let me use an example of an organization I helped um, drive data literacy in. And this was around it. I mean, it had a hunt at the time. If you had Googled it, it said at 111,000 employees. That's a lot. Right. So you're not going to drive data. That's going to be a long program. But what they did is they trained more specifically. And I think the end goal, if I remember right, was to create a data literacy army that could then go out. So we did a six month engagement, trained maybe 150 people. So you're thinking 150 out of 111,000. Yeah, because then these people that leaders were buying in and these people could go out and permeate throughout the organization. Wonderful way to do it. Another one that I'm, I'm helping and have helped in the past is the U.S. Army. This one's interesting because the U.S. Army is, is done in a certain way. You're taught not to take orders or to question orders, all of that, right? And they want, they're driving a 1.4 million person data literacy initiative. And I had the, the privilege of going in July. And I think the group I spoke with was the strategic operations group. Um, and uh, that talk about the probably two coolest people and no offense to anybody else who's been in my sessions. I had two Brigadier Generals, I believe, in that session. One in person, one who wasn't. And Brigadier General Schultz, Dusty Schultz, her mindset is so refreshing where I had someone ask in that session, they're like, um, we're taught not to question things. And then Dusty, um, as she goes by, I think, and now granted, I, I should probably call her General Dusty and all that, but um, <laughs> he was like, no, we have to change our mindset. It doesn't mean you're questioning orders. Mm -hmm. It means you're asking intelligent questions on how we're doing things and stuff. Mm -hmm. That is a massive change. Mm -hmm. That is a massive shift. That's hard but they're doing it and they're being successful with it. And so I think that mindset and that true buy-in, those are some examples of seeing these things actually come, come to life. And it's, I mean, it's really cool. Absolutely. Now we're, we're coming to an end here. So I do want to do the draw, but I have one last yeah. question for you. Have you ever run fast? Well, uh, more miles than you have driven in one trip in your Tesla. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. I, I think Great. I have, I think, and I have run an ultra marathon or in multiple mar ultra marathons. Each one of those has run more than I'm trying to think. That's a good question. <laughs> I would bet the answer is yes. I don't think I've driven it in one trip over 50 miles yet. And I've done right. multiple ultras where I've hit 50 uh, miles or more. And mm -hmm. so uh, I would think the answer to that question is, yeah, that's kind of well, cool. That's impressive. I never thought of that. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to have to think on that one more. <laughs> that's impressive. All right. I do want to do the draw here. So let's, uh, where are you? Where are you? Let's see who the winner will be of Be Data Driven. Come on. Jean Francois. Congratulations, Congratulations Jean Francois. What I would say is, Jean Francois, send me a message on LinkedIn, and we'll find a way to get a book out to you. It's gonna be it's gonna be an actual physical copy, um, and so we'll get that out to you. That's awesome! Congratulations, and thank you so much, Jordan, for all your insights and for putting up amazing content. Follow Jordan Mora on LinkedIn if you are not already. And awesome. thank you for your lovely energy and for your willingness to share so much and to to help people on this journey of becoming more data driven. Oh, and, thank um, you. Congratulations on the books. I know that it's hard to to get books out, uh, to write them, to get into the space of writing them, but uh, they are changing people's lives, at least professionally, which is amazing. And uh, good luck on the new book as well. Awesome. Thank you both for having me. It's it's my pleasure for being here. I feel very grateful for it. Oh, likewise. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Bye. <laughs>